Hello and welcome to Debating Europe's live stream event here in the European Parliament on who should decide what is acceptable online. Uh, my name is Joe Lidabarski, I'm the editor of Debating Europe and I'll be moderating this panel discussion today. And joining me uh, to my left, uh, Lorcan uh, Price, who is legal counsel at ADF International. Um, beside him is Julia Moser, who's communication officer and hate speech advisor at SAGE. Um, to my right, we've got Benjamin, Benjamin Ledwin, who is head of Brussels office for Bitcom, which is uh, an association representing um, German uh, tech companies and digital companies, and then Eva Medel, who is a Bulgarian MEP with the centre-right European People's Party. Um, so we've asked you to send in your comments and questions on this topic, on the topic of hate speech, moderation, what sort of content is acceptable and not online. Um, I'd like to start off by putting a question from one of our readers to the panel uh, and see uh, where you draw your line, what you think is acceptable content online. This was sent in from Lubomir. Eva, I'd like to start with you. So Lubomir argues uh, free speech shouldn't mean you can slander others, lie, uh, misinform deliberately, or incite others to violence and bloodshed. So he's obviously saying there has to be a limit to freedom of speech somewhere. Um, presumably you'd agree, and where would you set that limit? Well, first of all, it's an excellent question, I think, um, to kickstart the debate today. But it's also kind of the million dollar question or the multi-billion dollar question uh, we have to pose um, ourselves. Um, it's, it's, it's a very fine line um, and it's something that I've been thinking uh, quite a bit because on one hand, uh, we are aware that hate speech is what it is and it cannot be uh, tolerated but to what extent can we make sure that society once somebody um, you know uses it the the content is is brought down how do we make sure that this is not re-uploaded or it's not just about applaud, applauding it online or it's more about making sure that we tame ourselves a little bit and don't use this sort of um, of, of expressions and, and hate speech. And it's, it's something that is extremely difficult. This thing will be there to stay, probably. One can uh, probably go back and argue it's part of our DNA to be aggressive, perhaps in one person more than in another. Um, and so, um, as I said, it's, it's so difficult to draw that line. What's important, I think, is, is, is once you've been there and, 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 and you did it, to have some sort of repercussions so that this thing does not occur again. How this exactly will be done and should be done, I think we have plenty of uh, actual experts uh, that probably deal with this on a daily basis. So I'm also going to be uh, curious to hear what steps we can take to, to help society um, yeah, well, produce like to... more, more speech that uh, we can argue and debate about but uh, less that is offensive. Yes, well, I'd like to bring in Ben here because your organization, obviously, um, for some of the internet platforms that you represent, will, uh, will deal with this question about, you know, online, what content is acceptable, where do we draw the line? So, so what would you say to the, the, the question from, from Lubomir here, or the comment from, from Lubomir? Yeah, I think it's really an excellent question because it brings us down to the core of the debate already, what is acceptable and what not. Before I get into the, the answer, Maybe let me um, briefly introduce our membership, which is very broad. Um, it's uh, it's platforms, it's 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 telcos. It's basically all the actors that um, that are involved in the in the digital ecosystem. So and um, that gives us a very good horizontal uh, overview. Um, regarding the question, um, it is it is it is very interesting because. Um, we believe that there is uh, a line already there in a, in a liberal democracy. Um, liberal democracy doesn't mean that you can say anything that comes to your mind. The line is the law, right? Um, so that is the, the, the starting point. The thing about law is, of course, uh, it can be interpreted. So, um, and that is really um, our, our main point in this, in this debate, um, that we should not leave the decision um, to, to automated systems or to uh, decisions under very tight deadlines. Sometimes in an hour you have to decide something is illegal and or not. This is the case in Germany, is that correct? So it needs um, to be within an hour. Exactly. So um, we were quite instrumental on the Network uh, Enforcement Act. 
um, that was yeah a very controversial point. It has a very clear scope. It um, it, it, it it kind of limits it to to, to very big platforms, and um, they now have to put mechanisms in place that uh, users can notify if something is in their opinion hate speech and then the service providers have to act right i think but what we were um, arguing strongly against was to leave that decision to automated systems because a lot of these questions come down to interpretation interpretation so it has to be um, a sort of competent state authority yes. and lawyers that take the, that take that decision don't leave it up to um, private companies um, that are under a lot of pressure because if they come up with the wrong decision, they have to pay a lot of sanctions. They are legally, they are liable. Yes. So that's exactly our point. It will, in the end, lead to overblocking because I they don't want to be exposed to that threat. That is very key to the debate. I think we, we'll come back to that because I think that it's actually at the heart of what we're, we're discussing here today. But first, um, I'll put the same question from Lubomir to, to Julia. What would you say? Uh, where, where would you draw the, the line? So where we draw the line when it comes to the Facing Facts Online course that we developed on hate speech specifically to teach people about how to counteract it either through monitoring or through counter speech is that freedom of speech is a super important and essential human right, but it's not an absolute one. So just as like I can extend my arm until it reaches your nose, it has its limits. And it, when it comes to also to criminal acts, to extortion, that's where freedom of speech start, stops to be protected. Mm. And this is where we kind of draw the line. So there are limits of freedom of, of expression, especially that when it's often used to, to, to abuse others, others um, online and also to exclude others from online discussion. So when, it's become, when it becomes a tool for exclusion, that is not okay anymore. And so your organization, SEGI, is, is working with um, kind of countering discrimination, mm -hmm. anti-Semitism, racism, xenophobia, and so on. So this is uh, this is an issue that you're you're very much working on on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes, and it's 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 the same. The same applies to the Facing Facts Online course and hate speech. That we are focusing on all forms of discrimination uh, and how to counter either hate crimes or hate speech. And I think when, I, when it, what misses often from these conversations is that this is not just removal that's an option when it comes to these online phenomena, but also there is so much to do in in in, in forms of counter speech and in, in forms of counter counter narratives and alternative narratives because there's slightly different. So there's plenty to do, but we need to educate people about these, these options so they can also take action and we don't necessarily just only have to rely on social media companies or the government exclusively. Interesting. They all have to come together. Okay. Um, Lorcan, I'd like to put exactly the same question to you, I suppose. So wh wh where do you think the line should be drawn? Well, it's a very good question because uh, the, the questioner raises a number of distinct issues. He talks about uh, whether or not slander should be permitted, lies and misinformation. And then he talks about uh, incitement to violence. And uh, those are all quite distinct concepts. And uh, you know, the lawyer would tend to try and break those down and analyze them separately. But what struck me about the conversation thus far is that, um, starting with our, our, our friend, the, the MEP, and right away around, it seems that there's a degree of agreement as to what constitutes hate speech. And the comment was made, we're all aware of what hate speech is. In fact, I would dispute that because the question of what constitutes hate speech is, in fact, a question that is uh, very much contended and argued over before courts. Uh, for instance, my organization is currently involved uh, in advising and consulting on a case that may go to the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights as to whether or not certain remarks about Islam are part of a open debate in Austria or whether they constitute uh, hate speech in the sense that it hurts and offends religious feelings. And we've moved somewhat in Europe, I might suggest, from a position in the past where courts like the European Court of Human Rights held that a fundamental part of liberal democracy was ideas that shock and disturb as being part of the conversation, to now a sense where we're moving towards a greater level of censorship about what can be said online. I think a point of agreement on the panel would certainly be that incitement to violence, which mm. is part of the question, is something that I think most right-thinking members of society would oppose uh, because of the direct harms involved with it. But the more nebulous concept of hate speech which has not been really well defined, and there are different standards around Europe as to what constitutes hate speech, 
raises a real problem with the way it's being enforced now, whether it be by algorithms or by greater intervention by, uh, by internet and social media companies, as to a chilling out and a removal of legitimate points of view from the conversation in Europe because they upset certain people. And a, a remark was made by Julia here, which is mm. that countering speech with speech, uh, and I don't want to misrepresent what you say, but I would agree insofar as one of the ways that a free exchange of ideas happens in a society is that we counter speech with other speech. We not necessarily counter it in a liberal democracy with censorious uh, mechanisms to remove speech from the public square or to penalise those who engage in speech that may well upset so certain people. I'm going to come to Julia. I'm going to ask you your, your response. But I want to put a, a question to you, Lorcan, uh, from Wendy. Because you mentioned a chilling effect. There's a chilling yes. effect um, that can be. Uh, where people feel that they don't want to, to um, contribute to a debate because they're worried that what they're saying might be misconstrued as, as hate speech or so on. Wendy argues that there is a chilling effect in the other way, in the other direction as well. She says uh, social media should be a safe space where opinions can be freely expressed. Um, so don't to toxic comments and bullying uh, create a sort of chilling effect, discouraging many people from exercising their, their freedom of speech. What would you say to that? Well one of the things, certainly, engaging in the public square, g going out of your house in the morning, you're going to be confronted with ideas that upset you. Uh, the notion of a safe space, I, I think, can be extended uh, unreasonably to constitute all forms of human communication. Um, I mean, if you want to protect yourself from ideas that upset you, you certainly wouldn't leave your house, ultimately. You would, uh, you would seal yourself off from discussion and dispute. One of the things that we have to accept in society is that we will be confronted with ideas that upset us. Um, how we deal with that is the question. And I think once you start to allow powerful actors, like the government by using the force of the criminal law or, you know, ever-increasing power of uh, internet companies to start to decide using whatever means, be it active people or algorithms, to remove certain points of view from what is essentially the digital public square, uh, then we have to raise real questions as to who decides whether or not these ideas are offensive. Um, so I can accept Wendy's point insofar as it's not nice to be upset, but part of the human condition in, in a liberal democracy and the free exchange of ideas is to encounter things that upset you. And, uh, Julia, this is exactly the question that we had from Eva, who, who decides? Who decides? Eva says, uh, who decides what is hate speech and what is just critical comment? In other words, who decides what is unacceptable content so, online? Um, and let me connect the answer to that, what Lorcan was saying, because there is, I completely agree, there is a, a bit of confusion about what exactly hate speech is, and I think it's often misused, the term, because people are like, oh, I know what hate speech is. This is what I, someone says that they don't like me. No, that's not hate speech, and there are indeed plenty of different definitions. There is one legal one, from the European Commission's framework decision of 2008 that says it's public incitement to hatred and to violence. So when it comes to um, hate speech and what we define as hate speech, I think it's safe to fall back on that definition and take hate speech as it is. It's true that what, when it comes to our work of education and anti-bias trainings, we use our definition that focuses more on a victim's perspective because we believe that when it comes to hate crimes and hate speech, it's the victim that has to be uh, put into the focus because she or he is the person who, who, who suffers there. And there we try to also measure the potential harm that is there for the person. So it's slightly different, but yeah, there is a, a difference between 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 criticism, between constructive criticism, and and clear hate speech and incitement. Okay. Uh, can yes, I Eva, also please. add on that point because um, we are currently working on a actually a proper text, a legislative file, um, and I don't want to bother with the details, but we are exactly uh, working and on crafting the words on um, uh, when it is about content, which is considered expression of opinion, uh, which might sound as opposing, or as you said, you might not like it uh, for one reason or another, but that does not mean necessarily that it incites violence, violence uh, uh, nor hate, uh, and it can remain online. Uh, and again, um, uh, here, um, I think the freedom of expression should not be hindered, but the challenge is that hate speech is illegal under uh, a certain conditions present in different countries with a different text in a different way. Uh, so uh, for platforms, in order to understand who posts it, from where do they post it, under different legislation, it's extremely challenging, I can uh, assume. Uh, and this is why I think if we are to be able to align among the member states uh, who enforce the law, uh, these definitions uh, might make it uh, a little bit easier, but probably it's a very challenging uh, thing.
to do. I'm sure that you're going to want to come up uh, back on that, Benjamin. Um, but I'll first, uh, Ava, if it's okay, I can put a, a comment to you from a user, um, uh, Maricella, who argues that internet platforms uh, should be fined if they don't implement a reporting system and immediately take action after getting justified complaints from other users. Maricella goes on, they should hire people if their AI is not capable uh, to handle these bad comments. Um, so some, she's saying, if automation is not, uh, if automation is a problem, as Benjamin was saying, then hire more people, uh, human moderators. What, what do you think of Maricella's comment? Is that a sensible um, approach? Yeah, well, I, I think it's extremely important to have the human factor as well as the AI. And I think it was mentioned also earlier by the other uh, participants of the discussion. Um, you cannot 100% rely on an algorithm uh, and sometimes it might be a lawyer that you might need to consult uh, sometimes it might be a professional within your organization uh, but that's definitely something that has to be taken into consideration uh, and we as uh, policy makers uh, are taking that into into account when we actually draft suggestions and, and, and legislation um, I think at the beginning even the statistics show that algorithm used to be uh, for almost 90% of the cases of removing contact uh, uh, right where now it's only about 60 to 70 percent exactly because the algorithms make mistakes so actually it has went down the way algorithms can can understand probably because people who write write it in a more sophisticated way I don't know or there's more content out there and it's more it should be helpful to assess it but that's what statistics show now so actually the human factor is even more important today Okay, so Benjamin, um, platforms want consistency, is that mm. true? Uh, what, how would you respond? I'm, yeah, consistency is the key, right? So consistency is the key to know how you, how you should react. Um, I'd like to come back to, to your point because I think it, it's a very interesting one. Because you mentioned we first have to analyze and understand the problem at stake. And um, Bitcom, our association, um, they engaged already in 2015 with uh, the question, what is uh, hate speech and how does it impact, how is it dealt with? Um, so from a very, very early stage. And um, what we found out, and it was really in interesting, was that quite a few people, quite a high number of people, was affected by hate speech, either by reading comments uh, or by being directly addressed. Um, but there was a real difference in how they reacted depending uh, on whether they were addressed directly themselves or whether they just read about it, right? And I think this is a, a really interesting um, conclusion because it's easy to just read about it and then let it go and, and not react. But we should raise the awareness that if you read about it, then, you know, notify or, or, or react to it. So it's a lot about these um, civic engagements, civic initiatives that raise awareness, that foster literacy, media literacy or digital literacy, as we call it, that is the key. And then to really analyze what are the actual numbers, who is affected by it, what is the harm. So we have to sort of quantify it. So this roundtable approach of bringing together all the stakeholders um, is a really important one. It's a good one. We have to do it for all actors, not only the big platforms. Don't forget about the small platforms mm. as well, because sharing of best practice is key, especially for them, because they might not have the capacities to actually. But this you know, is a learn voluntary, voluntary. That is very much. Of a, but I do see the role of the legislator there, because they can um, offer this sort of fora and uh, bring together the, the stakeholders, and um, so that is really, a, really a good approach from our experience, and it's it's better as. I mean, what I call a little bit exaggerated a legislative roundhouse kick by, you know, reaching out to 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 everyone and uh, and bringing um, yeah, companies in the scope that might not be affected by a certain problem, um, as with the terrorist content regulation that we might address later on. Um, so yeah, that's just. Uh, Maybe my remark. Uh, so, to that. Julia, we want to avoid a legislative roundhouse kick. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, um, two remarks on, on both of your comments. So, I, I completely agree, and, and I think one of the reasons why education and counter speech is so important because it doesn't necessarily change the mind of the perpetrator, but it signals for others and, and that it's not okay that that certain content is not okay. So, you kind of move from being an online bystander into taking action. 
And every time there is um, um, a discussion about whether algorithms and humans and how the two should be combined to combined to remove hate speech effectively, I also agree that there's need, there needs to be a combination. But I'm wary of there of 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 the impact on the moderators uh, when it comes to their daily job is to review all these materials. So it also has a human cost. So I think when it comes to hate speech, that's why we emphasize that it's not only the intervention that we need, but also the prevention part. And that that happens in forms of education, media literacy on hate speech and counter speech. But again, this is so. This is about uh, improving education, but also um, it's a it's a voluntary system. You're thinking of you you, you wouldn't support um, as uh, our reader said um, uh, fines for platforms, kind of a, a, a one hour limit for taking down uh, content. That you, you you sort of support a kind of broader approach. I'm afraid that would not result in the um, in what we desire to see. I I much prefer to to support educational programs, and if these companies could engage more in the support of right educational pro uh, programs of media literacy uh, skills being taught either in schools or in Facebook. We have our message popping up on the top of our news feed saying like, oh, today the weather is going to be rainy. How about we put a message about being responsible when it comes to sharing content that could also... So it, it sounds like there's broad consensus in terms of hate speech. Well, <laughs> you're afraid, making uh, a face. Go I on. disagree with that. What, what um, would you say? Well, it's, it's fascinating listening to this discussion because we've leapfrogged entirely over the issue of what constitutes hate speech to technical solutions to what is perceived as hate speech. And I think there's a really serious problem with that, particularly with the Commission getting involved and the power that it has. I'm aware of the 2008 definition of hate speech, um, and I don't want to get too technical with it, but there's a, there's a real tension in that definition between incitement to hatred, which is an entirely subjective emotion, and then incitement to violence. Now, I come from the, you know, the, the, I'm an Irishman and I'm from the, 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 the English legal tradition, and there was always a clear distinction between inciting someone to violence, which is instructing or encouraging or, in, in, in other ways, uh, demanding of somebody or uh, inducing them to commit violence against a certain person in a certain place. And this, this concept of hatred, which has ended up uh, affecting everybody from cake bakers in Northern Ireland to hotel owners in England to politicians in Austria. Um, and it's done in such a way and such a wide scope that it has, in fact, uh, in the context of the discussion we're having in Europe about a range of issues from migration to tax policy to integration uh, and everything in between, it has removed huge chunks of uh, what were for a long time considered acceptable opinions from the public discourse. And I, I think that's a very serious problem because if what you're doing is essentially uh, using soft law instruments or technical regulations to make illegal large sections of public opinion, which you may disagree with, and you may disagree with them very instinctively, and they may upset you deeply, but to say that they're illegitimate and they constitute uh, a crime, essentially, um, denudes the public square of opinions, while, as I say, might be very disagreeable, mm. or should be countered in other ways, such as through a conversation. And my fear is that the greater the extent of the censorship the more these views will manifest themselves in different ways and more radical ways. If you can disagree with something through, the, through a dialogue method, surely it's better than outlawing it and indeed requiring the, the, the platforms, the digital platforms, to be ever more aggressive in their removals. And I was looking at the, the report uh, from the Code of Conduct uh, published by the European Union here, and it's extraordinary the amount of con content that has been removed is growing year on year. And this is something that uh, the Commission has welcomed. I mean, I think we really need to pause here and ask ourselves the question, are we going down a route of censorship that ends up taking out perfectly legitimate points of view from the public conversation? I think, I mean, the panel can correct me if, if I'm uh, misinterpreting this, but I think that most people on the panel seem to be supporting uh, industry, self-regulation, education, and not necessarily for hate speech. but. I want to kind of talk to you about, um, you, you say incitement to violence is where you would draw the line, uh, because there is a distinction, of course, between hate speech and terror content. So you have uh, organizations like Islamic State putting forward propaganda videos, um, often inciting violence and so on, recruiting. Um, last week, we interviewed uh, Gilles de Kokova, who's the EU's um, counterterrorism coordinator. Um, and at the moment, there's uh, something called the EU Internet Forum, which is a industry kind of meeting with, with government, and it's voluntary and so on. Um, uh, he said 
we've reached a limit with that process. He believes that um, it's uh, not fast enough. Uh, he would like to see, and there is in fact um, uh, terrorist content, uh, the terrorist content regulation, which is going through the legislative process, which is about taking down uh, content quickly, setting time limits and so on. Now, Benjamin, you, you, you mentioned it. Um, I would like to ask you about it. What's your, the, the, your opinion on it, your organization's opinion on this, uh, this terrorism uh, yeah. content regulation? Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Um, before getting into the more technical side, um, I would just like to make clear from the very beginning that it's, the question is not about do we tolerate terrorist content online or not. It's a very sensible uh, question. Of course, no one does. The question is how do we deal mm -hmm. um, with this content? And I would just like to highlight um, a technical aspect here because if we read uh, the, the, the Commission's proposal, the scope is extremely broad, right? It, uh, it uh, basically um, encompasses uh, all hosting providers. That can be uh, email services, uh, social network. That can be basically websites with uh, a commentary section, right? And if the proposal goes through as it stands, that would require that all these um, websites would have to um, implement the necessary infrastructure, you know? And that could mean automated tools. That could mean um, yeah, people that are capable to uh, make a decision whether something stays or not within one hour. And that is just not feasible for uh, yeah, the small actors in the field. So what it would mean, basically, is that they would have to dock themselves to a larger infrastructure. So it would, it would lead, basically, to a market concentration. Because they wouldn't be able to implement that infra infrastructure, which would, which would be illegal. Um, so they have no choice. And that's, I think, a really important point to, to keep in mind. If it's one of the stated aims uh, of the Commission to, um, yeah, to avoid that market concentration. And um, you know, if, if we follow that path, then it will, it, it will lead to that. And we had one remark um, saying that, OK, you can just do that. If you have a website, you can just leave your table next to you uh, when you go to sleep. And then you get a call, and you react immediately. But that's that's not good enough. That's not going to do it. So, um, yeah, that is that is an important question mm. to to address. Very important question, so. Eva. Um, so we have Gilles de Kokova. He sits on the EU Internet Forum. So he is uh, he feels that 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 voluntary process, the sort of self-regulation process, has failed or has reached a limit. He says. Um, would you agree? Do you think that uh, for when it comes to terrorism content, maybe not hate speech, but maybe uh, terrorist content, that we need to have these kind of hard uh, laws in place? Well, yeah, you know, actually the Commission, I think, asked around 300 companies what are they doing to, to tackle hate speech, and about 13 replied. Um, so I guess we've reached that point, yes. Um, I've always been a defender in the past years here in the Parliament of uh, regulation for innovation. So if you would regulate, you better foster something good coming out of it, uh, as well as for self-regulation where that's uh, necessary and possible. Uh, again, um, you know, I don't know how things will play out. Um, we are still debating, discussing, and figuring out the latest um, piece of text. But it's a very tricky thing because we've seen how difficult it is to to kind of do something about it. Um, and one hour, especially for small players, to remove content is is very short. One can argue. On another hand, people would say, "Well, we are all connected, you know." But maybe we can extend that to a couple of hours or, or something to, to enable um, smaller players to, be, to, to, to kind of be able to, to, to remove this content when that is necessary. Okay. We, we're almost out of time. I want to very, very quickly um, go around the panel. Because I think basically what we're talking about today is technology is, is moving at an enormous speed, an ever-increasing speed, and we're talking about the policy tools to kind of catch up with technology, basically. So I'd like to ask you, Lorcan, do you feel, and ask all of you in turn, do you feel that we have the, the tools that we need? You know, are you happy with the status quo in terms of what we have? Um, or, or do you think we need to make changes? Well, <laughs> if, you, if you'll forgive me, I'll answer that by saying we need to decide uh, first of all, what it is that we're prohibiting. So before we get to the technocratic solutions, which a lot of the conversation was taken up by, we have to decide whether or not, for example, uh, the Dutch prosecutor's decision to investigate 200 pastors in the Netherlands for signing a statement about the traditional Christian view of marriage constitutes a hate crime. 
before we get to giving more power over to the Commission and uh, various regulators to start banning certain types of speech. But isn't there a, there's a time pressure as well? Because the, the, we're dealing with issues which, um, uh, I mean, the legislation that we have in place is uh, often for you know a decade old, and, and there, you know there's there's a legislation governing um, uh, content online which was you know drafted before Google existed. Yes. Um, and it's still on the books. So, so isn't there a kind of a time question? If we're having these sort of philosophical debates about what constitutes hate speech and so on, like, do we need to be having those debates faster? Are we having them at the right speed? Are you comfortable with...? Well, I, I hope your audience would agree with me that rushing into laws that are badly thought out before we even have the conceptual uh, foundations uh, agreed is a recipe for disaster, particularly across 28 jurisdictions or 27 soon, uh, maybe, uh, that have very different philosophical uh, traditions. I mean, the Irish and the British uh, outlook on freedom of speech is different from Germany for all kinds of historical reasons. So, uh, you know, approaching this with a monolithic regulatory uh, framework like we were discussing here today, to me, seems misguided and will end up creating the kind of problems that I identified, such as chilling the freedom of Europeans to express perfectly legitimate points of view about things affecting their lives, even if those points of view shock us. Okay, so Julia, we're right back at the very beginning of the debate. How do we define what hate speech is? Is that right? Right, yeah. But I think when it comes to um, content removal and moderation, we can look at the practical level and the role of moderators. We also need to reflect on, on, on the principles and the morality and the ethics behind, behind the possible legislation that, that, that we might arrive to one day. And where, this is where I think we all have to come together from society and governments need to take their role and also IT companies, civil society, experts, academia, uh, simply because it cannot be up to one single entity to do that. And it's also a question of trust. Do we trust social companies to do that? Not really. Do we trust our governments? Maybe some countries do, maybe in other countries it's, it's, it's less so. So, so it's, it's a very, very complex question, but there needs to be um, um, an agreement at some point. And I agree that it's very urgent to do this so because of, of what we see happening online these days. Okay, we're out of time. I'll just give you both you know, 30 seconds if you just very quickly want to say, is there anything you'd like to add or your... Let me just wrap up by saying I would be strongly in favor of following that uh, broad approach of bringing together actors from the public and private sector, from you know, big platforms, smaller pl platforms, members from the whole ecosystems that are uh, concerned. And um, to, to what uh, Mrs. Maydell said, if there is then an obvious failure for a specific platforms where we have clear evidence that it's been hijacked, for example, for uh, spreading terrorist content, then let's react to that. But let's avoid bringing in a whole range of companies that, are, that don't have that problem, but that then have to implement that infra infrastructure that is not reasonable. OK, last word, Eva Medell. Lastly, I don't think we should leave uh, citizens and people who are victims of hatred or violence uh, speech over the internet to just wonder what's going to happen with me, so to say. And I think it's important to combine efforts uh, with the policymakers, uh, with, as, 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 you, as you said, not only legislation, it's not necessary to legislate, but also the people and the platforms who try to self-regulate. Uh, um, every forum has uh, as a moderator, uh, so to say. Uh, so uh, let's make sure that we can find a way to collaborate. It's absolutely existential at this point because it's unclear whether you know one can do it or another one can do it in one country might work in one way and in another differently so we have to combine the efforts and find the best solutions for the different markets and the different so the different problems that would occur. Okay, well, we're out of time now. If you'd like to continue the debate, you can do on our website, debatingeurope.eu. Um, thank you very much to the panel for, for taking the time to be with us today, um, and thank you for watching. <laughs>